So, welcome to the NetApp Faz 8000 Geek Out. Um, I'm your host, John Martin, <laughs> and we have with us... And, I, and I'm Matt Herford. Look, you know, I've made myself a cup of tea. I advise you to do the same. Um, I've taken my shoes off, the fireplace is lit, and my curl, the toes are, are curling in the bearskin rug, waiting to tell you all about the new Faz 8000 platform. <laughs> We're trying to channel the spirit of Roy and HG at this point in time. We're here primarily to talk about the new Faz 8000 product line. Um, so I try to keep the builds like down to a, a bare minimum. But if I was going to say, um, and we were joking about this beforehand, um, you know, this, this product launch is going to buck 30 years of industry trends. We're actually making them larger, slower, and more expensive. But that's actually not true. <laughs> <laughs> Um, in fact, if this presentation was just about the fact that we had presented something which were denser, faster, and cheaper, um, that would hardly be news, would it, Matt? No, it, no, it certainly wouldn't. Look, I mean, there's obviously a bunch of new product, and we're going to discuss this in length later. Um, I think there's some really good innovation in these new controllers, but for me, it's um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a core theme here, it's about unleashing the power of clustered on tap. You know, the reality is that we're providing a extremely powerful platform that's going to return a better investment for anybody that's looking to purchase and invest in, in NetApp's technologies moving forward. Okay, cool. So um, the main things, and there are two things, and we'll go into this later on, but if I was to say there's two big things which come out of this launch, the first one is that these are really the first of the controllers that we've created which are really designed specifically for scale-out. Absolutely, and that's and that's that's important, right? You know, the we've been we've been selling clustered on tap in in ANZ now for well probably you know in in anger for for probably twelve months. And the exciting thing there is to, is to put a bit of background on that is that you know we are the leading geo in terms of attach rate for clustered on tap. Really? Yeah. Every you know fifty percent of the controls that we're selling now in ANZ um, are, have clustered on tap on board. So for me, if we look at where those controls are selling in terms of historically now the three thousand platform. And the fact that people are looking for that scalar architecture, I think it's really encouraging to think that we already have some penetration in the market, and now we're bringing a platform that really enables scale out. As an antipode, and that actually makes me proud because there was, you know, uh, we were the first, you know, area like to really adopt virtualization aggressively, and I think that you know that's that kind of innovative sort of, you know, approach is actually showing the fact that we're actually, you know, taking the lead with all this new, really new good stuff. So, I'll go into this in a little more detail now. Uh, hopefully the little mouse will work for me. So we're going to talk a little bit about the context of why it was we designed these controllers the way that we did because nobody knows how, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care and understanding why we did things will add a little bit of context to what we're doing. So of course the massive you know, storage vendor massive data growth slide. Um, I, I'm kind of surprised we don't have a picture of a pile of CDs round, you know, mounting up to the moon to show the massive data explosion. But as cliche as it is, it's still a fact. Um, no, it, it absolutely is. You know, and if you look at some of these things around, you know, technologies and complex operations, I think one of the challenges that that IT vendors have is 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 enabling customers to um, to grasp the return on you know and and, va and get the value out of of what we're selling. Um, you know, if I was to to take these things down, and there's a key word there that really that really comes out to me, and that's time. Um, I think that you know we have less and less time. We have less and less time to to realise that return on on what you've been sold. We have less time to actually do it. That the business is more demanding. We're looking for agility, and I think that you know if NetApp is is focusing on one thing at the moment, yeah. I think these platforms do underpin that is is returning time back to back to our customers. Yeah, and the other thing is that. You know, as cliche as it is, it's actually getting to be more true than it ever was beforehand. You know, um, just it's the problem is getting worse, not better. Exactly. Um, so we can't talk about the fact that there's also this change between the fact that people have been buying infrastructure. Whoa, a slight animation. Um, that people have been buying infrastructure for some time. They're now moving towards looking at either purchasing cloud or moving things into a service provider context or becoming service providers themselves um, and the way we think about IT is changing so yeah I think I think that it's very true right and if you look at a lot of things from where we've come from I think that you know what was an exception probably you know, maybe 10 15 years ago well, 10, 15 try that four it's probably now the norm right yeah. people are looking for shared they're looking for you know whereas before we bought dedicated architecture. It would, it would, people were looking to purchase something for their company yeah. 
that, that they now see as lock-ins. They're looking to lease that, whether it's through a service provider or mm. through a, a leasing or a, you know, an OPEX-based budget. I think that you know, the key message is here is that you know, IT is needing to evolve. Yeah. Um, there was a stage there where IT drove the business. There was a stage there where business drove IT. <laughs> I think now they're coming together and IT is realising it needs to provide at a fundamental level the services the customers and the yeah. business are expecting. Because it's interesting, I remember asking not that long ago, three years ago, probably at the, at the oldest, asking people, so do you have a chargeback model or are you implementing chargeback or are you looking at, you know, have you defined your SLAs? And almost universally it was like, oh yeah, kind of sort of going to get around to that maybe. And yet you ask people now and I'd say it's probably top of everybody's agenda. No, exactly right. Um, so the scale out I mean we're talking about these things being scale out storage systems they still run 7 mode yes absolutely they do yeah, fully so, support 7 mode um, but the main thing to this is we're building these things for scale out which is interesting because this actually changes the way in which I think we need to think about how we quote and design and think about the systems because traditionally storage has always been a scale up thing I want more power I buy a bigger model when that runs out of juice I buy a bigger model Absolutely. I think the days of buying a, a large storage array through whatever, whether it was OPEX or CAPEX, and then growing into it and, and not really realising that return are, are probably gone, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, like every good geek, I, was, I, I play with a lot of Lego. So, <laughs> so if I look at um, where we are in terms of, you know, the Lego building blocks and what the 8,000 gives, it gives an awful lot more Lego for your brick. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, with this architecture of, you know, you can scale, scale this one up. We're not, we're not yep. saying scaling this up is bad. But I think that it's absolutely designed to meet that point where we, you know, a, a customer can invest in a relatively small block at a, at, at a fairly cost-effective price. Yeah. They can scale out their architecture when they need to buy a new controller. In this case, they can just continue adding capacity to it. I think this is the first, you know, purpose-built platform that's enabled us to do that. The other thing that also changed, I think, is that in the old days, the performance game was how many hundred, you know, how many hundreds or thousands of spindles can I throw onto a workload in order to make to get the performance I need. Flash also changed that. So the fact that these things have a boatload more flash capability, I think is a really key factor as well. Look, it's taken out, we're back to that simplification and that time element, right? We're not asking customers to try and figure out which ports they need now. We're building all those ports in for the future, yep. regardless of what they want to use the box for now or in the future. The same with the caching, right? It's, you know, it's providing that flexibility that there are no longer some caveats around how many of these boxes can I put in a cluster versus this box versus that box and what on top. It's all gone away. Yeah. You know, we are making these things so you have enough cache to do whatever you want to do with the box. Yeah, so there's a lot of headroom built into these things. Um, so, you know, the main things, and I'll, I'll kind of skip past this slide relatively quickly, but, you know, the whole idea is that everything is, you know, two times bigger, two times faster, I mean, speed does still matter to, you know, it's time to results, time to market, that sort of stuff. So, Absolutely. Look, and I've, I've quoted these things up, and what's, what's really encouraging for me is not only have we been able to throw effectively twice as much hardware inside the box, mm -hmm. but we're getting twice as much performance out of it. Yeah. And I think for, from, if you look at that from a hardware engineering and a software engineering perspective, that's rarely achieved. Yeah. Right? Often, you know, you put a bunch of hardware in it, it takes some time for the, the software layer in clustered on tap in this case to catch up and actually deliver on that capability. You know, that, that's not the case. You know, you are going to get a box which in, in most cases is, is twice as powerful as the model it, it, it replaces. And in, 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 in across the board, and I've been doing some quoting, these systems are now quotable. Um, you know, the, they're, no, they're no more expensive. They're on a price point, yeah. if not in some cases cheaper than the platforms they replace. But we're still keeping all those storage efficiency features. Of course. Yeah. It's fundamental to what NetApp does. Uh, and back to that, you know, back to that time thing and that simplicity thing, you know, I think they're going to become more more default. You are going to have those on by default when yeah. you buy NetApp. There's not going to be a bunch of complexity around how do I turn this on, how do I enable that, how do I, how do I get access to this. The way the snapshots were on defa by default. Exactly. The so. platform can now support it. There is no caveats around how much memory you're pegging and how much fingerprint, blah, 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 blah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. gone, right? Yeah. You have a platform, you want to turn the efficiency feature on, you turn it on and you manage it. And the other thing which I really like now, because people have been asking me this for ages, is we no longer have a V-Series product line. Well, actually, in the FAS 8000, we no longer have a V-Series product line, which means that now just by throwing on that software license, you can take those storage efficiency features and apply them to EMC, HDS, and our own... Um, uh, e-series arrays. E -series arrays. Yeah, look, and, it, and it's providing that flexibility again, right? You know, it was a problem before where, you know, you had to buy a V-series controller up front to provide that capability in year two yeah. and year three if it came about. 
Um, you had to be thinking ahead of where you needed to be. And now you can buy a FAS8000 platform, you can you can license FlexArray at the point of purchase or any time during the life cycle of that product. Yeah. Um, and then you can attach third party. You know, it really is taking that idea of that software defined storage a little bit of a step further. And also, you know, Custom Tap is, is providing that capability to. Yeah. And it, when you think about consumption models, about the idea of the customers are asking vendors to take on way more of the risk. Yes. This is one of the things where by adding in that extra headroom, by making these things software options rather than hardware things you need to buy up front. We're taking a lot more. We decrease the risk of making the wrong decision from the customers quite significantly. Absolutely. You know. You know. You may. You may have. You know. You, you may not have any third party arrays now that you want to put on the net app, but in the future you may see the value of clustered on tap, and you can make that decision down the track. It's cool. not. A, it's not an upfront investment anymore. So um, accelerating. You know, talking about sort of these things. Two point six million IOPS. I've got to feel I should raise my finger to the. You know, <laughs> yes, a million IOPS. I need a small bald man to help me yes. out at this point. <laughs> um, yeah. Look, the reality is that we you know we've NetApp has been. We you know we've been we've been boxed in in some regards into terms of oh, but you're not really high end. You're not really tier one. Well, the reality is, how big do you want your storage array to be? Yeah. You know, do you want two point six million IOPS? I think it's something around fifty seven petabytes of, of storage yeah. capability. You know, you've got hundreds of fiber channel ports. You've got literally hundreds. I mean, you know, that conversation, to be quite frank, is off the table. Yeah. You know, with the scale architecture, with these high performance, we provide, as I said before, this Lego building block that's powerful. But also, you know, with the 8060 array, you've got a box here which is more powerful than the 6250 um, yeah. storage controller. The reality is from that is that we've got a, you know, We've got the best of both worlds, right? You've got a you've got a building block for scale out, but if you really need that big box to provide bandwidth for a bunch of you know high performance applications or your general ledger or whatever it may be, yeah. we can do that because we've got some we've got a big powerful machine that can stand on its own. Look, there's nothing wrong with scale up. I mean, it's like best of both worlds. Hmm. Um, the other thing is, does anybody need 2.6 million IOPS? I'd hope not. And if they do, we've got another product that's probably better suited to them. Right. Um, the reality is that you know if you've got a very high op, and we haven't come out here making to be honest, BS statements around we can do 2 million petaflops and all kinds of stuff around this new array. This array is built to meet 90% of business needs on a virtualized shared storage infrastructure. Yep. Um, if you want to have these exception cases where you've got ex extremely high performance workloads, where you need hundreds of thousands of IOPS, absolutely, we can cater those with clustered on tap with, yep. with SSD tiers, or we can move you across to a, an EF550 all flash array. And I think you know that's, that's the beauty of now being a product company. Yep. And I also kind of like the fact that and 216 terabytes of auto tiering flash. That's yeah. an absolute boatload. Uh, that is for the NAS workloads rather than the SAM workloads because that requires the 24 nodes. But that's still an absolute. That's, that's more flash than most people have, like as their total working. Yeah. Look, if you've got an Oracle environment running NFS that needs 216 terabytes of flash, then please come and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> Press hard three carbons. Yeah. Um, and again, the idea of that it's still keeping those things where the flex clone, all those capabilities we've had for quite some time. And this is where quite often, just this is where we return really large amounts of time and value to the to the company. People like Revlon who use these kind of capabilities um, that are sort of doing 400 times more projects. People like ING who produce entire copies of their bank inside of five minutes without having to go through and you know copy entire sets of data. So, I mean, this is still a core part of what we're doing and a lot of the stuff which is inside this the hardware to support this and the upcoming releases of ONTAP which make this even better I think it's actually really quite cool absolutely no no you know, we're taking nothing away and we have a we have a, an ever increasing reference use case of where a bunch of these technologies and, and primarily here we're talking about flex client are being utilized by customers to okay. you know to their advantage cool I've got a couple of questions online um, one was can I get the annoying beeps out of the phone unfortunately no I can't that is a, um, a charming feature of our um, uh, conference calling we, we can blame those people that were too busy to dial in on time. Yes. So, um, And the other one is, can I elaborate further on auto tiering? I will. We've got a section on that when we get a bit geekier. And if I don't cover it, I'm more than happy to cover it then. Perfect. Um, so streamlining IT operations. This is the whole idea we had by scaling out controllers. The idea is that as you need to, there is more. We will give you more stuff than you could possibly need. There is... You know, even on the smaller controllers, the, the FAS 8020s, right, which is the entry level of our mid-range, you can throw on 24 of these controllers into a scale-out array, and it's ready to go right now. And that's really exciting, right? And, you know, Ricky and I first met when I was a customer, and Ricky was my SE. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I come from a, from a long, you know, system programming operational background. And, you know, the, the reality here, the most exciting thing in this 
for me, is still that non-disruptive operations. Yep. Right. I can build these massive scale out arrays, and to be honest, if you're building, you know, if I, I think of that logically from that background, if I'm putting in these 80, 20, or 80, 40 building blocks, which are which are fairly cost efficient, can scale out to these large clusters as my business grows, you know, I can I, with that and with that, you know, that with that multi controller architecture. Mm. I do have more capability to move those workloads around and actually truly realize that non-disruptive capability. Do you need 24 nodes to do that effectively? I hope not. <laughs> um, no, obviously you can do that on two nodes or four nodes, right? Yeah. But I think that the, the idea is that you're not making a massive investment. You're not going you know, to have to wait three years until you've got multiple controllers in your cluster to be actually yeah. realize that vServer migration capability. Um, so again, I'm getting some questions about things like how many drive shelves are supported per controller pair. So people are desperate for us to get to the technical meet. I will get to that. Um, <laughs> Bear with us. We've got the gig slides coming. So uh, ba, 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 ba. I think we've covered this pretty well. Um, I, another thing we can mix your existing assets, and I'll cover this in more detail later on. But one, hmm. not only can we throw in your existing um, uh, things like you know the 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 VNXs and your USPs and your you know your husses and stuff like that. We can also throw on your old NetApp shelf. So if you're a NetApp customer, it's not like oh here's the new controller. Go and buy a whole stack of new shelves. Yep. We can still use the old S4s for those of you who are not NetApp customers. S4s are, are shelves that we stopped selling three years ago, um, but there are still people using them. Absolutely, They've got critical workloads on them. We're not going to push people to reinvest in things they don't need to reinvest in. Yeah. Um, so moving right along, um, non-disruptive operations. Again, we talked a little bit about this, but this, you know, I love this little animation. The nice is showing us replacing an 80, an 80, 20 with an 80, 40. In fact, what you would probably see is the people who already have clustered data on tap that are running on say our older FAS 31 and 32 series. Yep. This is how they would go through and re-migrate and add in the FAS 8000s. In fact, if they've got clustered data on tap already with our older controllers, they can r roll in these 8000s completely non-disruptively. And that's one of the big data lifecycle challenges that people face. Absolutely. There's no, there's no, um, we're not placing any caveats about putting these new 8000 platforms into your existing clusters. Yep. Um, better management we've simplified because I think that I think it would be fair to say that the early cluster mode installs required sort of a you know we had a dedicated team of experts to go in and do that absolutely I think that um, now we could reasonably in fact I actually saw a video of some of our most senior people trying to put together a cluster um, some of our executives some of our executives yeah some, some people like BP you know our CTO and like the, yes. guy, the guys that haven't actually been technical for quite some time but they're really, really I mean scarily smart guys trying to put together a cluster for the first time and you could tell that you know this wasn't something even a smart person could just do intuitively I think that one of the a lot of the big changes we've made a lot done a lot of work in this to make this so that you can get a cluster apart from that we'll factory ship these things pre-configured yep. but if you want to and you need to go through and set up these clusters it's a bang 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 follow the bouncing ball and away you go so we've spent a lot of money on the usability yeah and that's a great approach to get funding to do it right yes yeah. <laughs> to go and get an executive who won't give you funding to, to muck it up um, <laughs> so the reality is yeah i mean the wizards now and the, and the way that we can we can set these things up it's 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 streamlined and yeah. it's simplified again once again it goes back to that you know, getting the value when you purchase it yeah. and giving you time back to go and do other things in your role. And there's things which aren't strictly part of the 8,000 launch but kind of apply to our entire range because that's kind of the way we do things because as much as this is good hardware, it's really a software layer that you're managing, yep. is things like um, Performance Advisor. Yes. Have you seen Performance Advisor in anger yet? I have seen the new version of Performance Advisor and it's very exciting, right? Yeah. I think we've taken some of the um, some of the Acori technology and, and yep. built that into that platform. Um, I think there's some huge benefits. I think it's actually giving performance advice where, as I think our previous products, if we're well, like perfectly honest, it's, it's, pro it's probably telling you what just happened, <laughs> yes. um, which, which, isn't, which isn't really advice. It's kind of, you know, how can I save my job? Yeah, well, it, it is great to have a rear view mirror, but it's a lot better to actually have a GPS uh, to tell you where you need to Where turn. you should have been in the first place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and this is also part of our cloud infrastructure being part of things which you can throw into Amazon private storage, say, for example, and also becomes the foundation of that hybrid cloud stuff that we've been talking about. And this is really exciting, right? And when we talk about scale out, I often, I often extend that into this, this, this um, you know, unbound cloud theory of, you know, we scale out so far that we can scale out from your data center into somebody else's data center into Amazon's data center. Yeah. That's how scale out we are, you know, and, and, and I think this, this platform just reinforces that, right? And if you look at what we've done with the ONTAP version this is being released with it at 8.2.1, we've also brought in mm. ONTAP Edge yes. in a clustered mode. So yep. 
the, 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 must admit, my, getting my head around the fact that we had a one node cluster was a little confusing for a while. <laughs> um, but, you know, effectively the VSA in ONTAP Edge now is supported with clustered ONTAP with this platform. So, you know, you've got that capability to have your core data in a private cloud, burst into a service provider, burst to Amazon for workloads, all using data ONTAP yep. and all using SnapMirror as your, as your data transport effectively yep. in the cloud. But then you can also have your remote branch or, you know, that, that office in Darwin or whatever it may be connecting up to your cluster and manage that as one, you know, one single entity. Pretty nice. Um, so we're going to do the deep dive stuff. Um, so one of the questions was, is the performance advisor available for seven mode? I honestly can't remember. I believe that it does work for seven mode. We need to check. I, I would counter that. Yeah. I think the, the, new, um, the new product may only be for clustered on tap, but we, we'll get back to you. The flex array uh, stuff, um, let me see. I think we actually kind of covered this reasonably well. Um, so the Flex Array Storage Virtualization Software, this allows us just with a single license to go through and virtualize EMC arrays, HDS arrays, and our own E-Series stuff. Absolutely. Um, so that's a smaller list of things than we had with our old V-Series. Is there a reason for that that you're aware of? No, there's not. Other than, other than I think that, you know, there's obviously complexities when we start building interoperability matrices out. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality is that, you know, that testing... Um, and the kind of governance that NetApp wants to put on, you know, ensuring that the, that the system is going to run is fully supportable. Um, you know, we we can't cover everybody. The other the other question might be that perhaps as other storage vendors aren't being successful in the market, and we don't need to worry about them as much. Look, there is a bit of that, and I think that if I take a look at the roadmap, I think what you were seeing is a requalification process going through because there are actually some technical things we had to get over. It wasn't just us being yeah. difficult with the V series versus the versus the FAS. We actually had to make some changes. To make sure this stuff would all work. Exactly so. right. You know, and you know, yeah. And clustered on tap, we did rewrite the operating system. Let's be fair. So yeah. you know, we, we it, it needs to be requalified back again. Um, sorry, just make sure I've got everything. Um, so again, single storage pool, and this is kind of an interesting concept with the fact that the idea is that underneath clustered data on tap, while you're still dealing with things like aggregates and volumes. To a great extent, you're now managing this as a single management domain, which means that rather than having to manage 20 different arrays or 20 different filers or 20 different things, you're managing one thing, getting management out of one place. Um, S simplicity and time again, right? Yeah. You know, you send your storage, or send your, you may not even have a whole resource in your customer base who's looking after storage now. That's yeah. a reality in most of our customers. So if he, he, he goes on a couple of cluster data on tap training courses, yep. he's covered. He can manage your entire storage environment. And the other thing is C dot has sorry, C dot cluster data on tap has a really extensive API. And I think we're seeing as more automation kicks in, it's not going to be a guy that's managing this stuff. It's going to be system center or UCS director or Yeah, exactly right. There's a bunch of these super element managers that are going to look after our stuff. And you know, if if you guys are familiar I'm not sure we've got slides, John, but if you know the WFA for the workflow automator tool that we provide. Um, I've seen some customers doing some amazing things. In fact, I was talking to a customer um, the other day, and they've they've effectively fully automated their entire um, with clustered on tap their entire DR scenario for their VMware farm. Right, and it's completely almost completely similar except for the restart in the VMware element um, <laughs> because it changes networks. Yeah. Um, but but they've you know the entire process they hit the go button for DR the entire scenario takes place completely automated. Right. Um, it's pretty impressive stuff. And this product, you know, we. We provide um, it's enormous value with, with extremely low cost yep. on our control platforms. And again, unified. Does that really make a difference to people? Are there people running SAN and NAS at the same time, or do you think it's just one of those things where it doesn't matter what you want to throw at your infrastructure? It's one application. It's just a software license. It's not a you buy a SAN array for this thing, you buy a NAS array for this thing. It's just a software license and sort of reinforces the whole software-defined infrastructure portions. Yeah. Oh, look, I mean. Interestingly, I think some of the competitors in the marketplace are trying to to, 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 to re-divide that up, right? Yeah. Because they have limited capability. So they're kind of saying, oh, you kind of want to have a nice cozy solution for this mm -hmm. and you want to kind of put a sound solution in for that. Um, I think the reality is in, time, in terms of time and, you know, getting value from, from where your people are spending their time managing storage, you want to have a unified storage yeah. platform. Actually, the other thing which I think is interesting, we'll touch on this when we get to the deeper dive portion, is their ability to convert from fiber channel to Ethernet without requiring anything new in the controller because we've got those new unified type target adapter. So basically you plug in a fiber channel adapter and it becomes fiber channel. You plug in a 10 gigabit ethernet adapter, it becomes 10 gigabit ethernet. It's the same 
physical port that you can use for either, and you can just switch the two using a software setting. Exactly right. You, you know, if you bought if you bought a fiber channel port, and then you and you're going to go to Ethernet in the future, you don't have to go and change the card in the box. You just change the cable. Right, which is important because I think there's still Absolutely. a lot of, there's a lot of people arguing. Oh, it has to be fiber channel. Or, oh, I've got this infrastructure. Or no, Ethernet is a way of the future, and it's like yeah, it doesn't matter. Exactly. You know, we well, want to get decent bandwidth at low latency to your application. What is the most effective way for you to do that? within your unique situation. Yeah, we'll sit over in the corner of the data center where your network guys have made up their mind, let us know. Yep. And again, I'm um, going through and sort of helping to push down that data growth stuff. I'll kind of flick past this because I want to get out to the platform details. I think the guys want to see some yeah, platform absolutely. details. absolutely. So, Sandy Bridge chipset. So we've finally, um, you know, managed to get data on tap working with the latest Intel chipsets. Um, and I think that at this point in time, the work that we've done to make sure that we're kept, you know we're kept keeping pace with the Intel TikTok stuff is we're there now. We're actually right in the front of that wave, which is been... and I think making you know little things like making the operating system posits compliant, all that kind of stuff has helped with that. Right, mm -hmm. we haven't had to go back backwards the engineer code bases to make sure we can keep up with with where they're taking the hardware layer. Um, it's look, it's really exciting. And as I said at the start, for me, what's more exciting is not only have we put in these multi-core processes in but on tap is realizing the benefit of them and yep. that's where a lot of the performance is, is coming from um you know gen 3 architecture and your pci bus fantastic i mean nvram this is interesting right so i think they're on the high-end boxes that we used to have ssd back cache um yeah so it's flashback cache which means that when you know god forbid you have a power outage through your entire data center with the old battery back caches we used to have yep those would last somewhere between three and five days. And that's been good enough for the vast majority of our customers. It's customers that are still in business. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Um, but it's nice now we're actually bringing down a whole bunch of features that used to be only in the high-end platform. So now if there's a, if there's a, fa a power failure, it actually destages that to persistent storage. And this is exciting, right? We have bought all those truly enterprise features that were yep. perhaps hidden away in the 62,000 series into the 8000 series, into the mid-range market, and that's really exciting for me in terms of you know where we can where we can talk about actually you know applying these and what workloads we can yep. put on them. And it's interesting. There's other things like the PCI Gen 3 and the DDR3 technology, which you might say, "Go, yeah, well, so what?" It's interesting. At the rate that we're starting to pull data through the various components, we're actually really starting to stretch the capabilities of these things. When you start talking about pulling through gigabytes per second worth of bandwidth. And yeah. like you know, multiple ten gigabit ports and multiple you know fiber channel you know sixteen gigabit fiber channel ports, having that stuff there actually makes a substantial difference to the overhead and the burst capabilities of the system. And well. I know that you know, we, be, we be, NetApp is thinking a lot about that, and yeah. that, you know, and we are working on solutions to that to make sure that we don't you know build bottlenecks into our hardware. I mean, this hardware platform is being released with eight two one, but it has hardware features that are ready for eight three. Yeah. Um. It, it is not you know we are we are absolutely thinking ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the UTA two ports, which I think I've got a better slide on later on. So one of the, somebody asked earlier on how many um, how many shelves and things like that can I add to these things? Well, let's just take a look at this within the context of the control range that we still have. Okay, the eighty twenty still has the same number of drives. It's four hundred and eighty drives, assuming twenty four drives per controller. I cannot do math without my phone, but that's what, 24, I'll work it out later on. But basically it's the a same lot. number, it's, it's a lot. I think it's something like six shelves for the um, for the 8020, um, double that for the 8040, and again, pretty much double that again for the 8060. The short answer is, you can put more shelves onto these things than you will probably ever need. I mean, any one of these things, you know, does anybody, hands up, who needs more than a petabyte on their entry level controller? Yeah, exactly. It's it's the short answer is how much does it have? More than enough. And if it's not more than enough, we can go to the bigger controllers. And if that's still not more than enough, we can scale out. That's you know, it's it's more than enough. The exciting thing here really is around this VST, right? The the massive increases in VST in the in the eighty twenty eighty forty models. Um, it, it's it's really quite exciting what we can do. And I know I've been playing around with a bunch of quotes because that's what I do in my spare time. But but the price points around the hybrid disc shelves where we are putting some SSDs and some SAS disks or some SSDs and some, some SATA-based technology into a dish shelf, they're really quite exciting. Yeah. Right? I think that you know, NetApp is absolutely putting a stake in the ground and going that flash pool is absolutely a technology that we, we should be looking to adopt in our customer base. Um, so again, some questions about how many onboard ports and UTA ports. I've got a slide on that later on, so we'll get to that. But I'm now getting back to the question about how does the auto tiering work. Um, auto tiering, we have three ways of adding flash to a FAS system. 
The first way which we've been doing since about 2010, we've shipped over a petabyte worth of this within Australia alone, um, is flash cache, and we've been using that for quite some time. Um, again, real time. all of these things are real-time tiering. So that means that basically you don't have to wait until tonight or after a run goes through when people want their data to be either cheap or fast. This means that if it's not on the fast storage now, the second you do an I.O., it gets promoted up into the flash and all subsequent I.O.s happen out of that. It's very, very efficient. It happens at a 4K level. Um, and we've always done that with the flash cache. We have recently came out with something called Flash Pool, which is based upon SSDs, drives which are actually closely associated with the disks. And this is one of the areas where we've seen some massive increases, which you'll see in one of the future slides, about how much we can add to this. And I think you mentioned beforehand, the pricing of this is now really getting to be quite compelling. Absolutely, um, you know, you know, I, I, you know I, I'll talk honestly, but because you know, previously the flash cache technology was 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 probably the most cost effective way of putting cache into a controller. Yeah, I, I, with my early delvings into the quoting system, you know, I I think there's some definite advantages yeah. with the flash pool technology, yeah. which is which is exciting, right? Because I think the SSD stuff is, you know, absolutely coming down in price, and you know, we, we've got dual, yeah. you know, dual manufacturer sourcing, all that kind of good stuff yeah. is in place to secure it for us. And the interesting thing is the rules of thumb that I've been using, which have worked pretty well, is how much flash do you need? And the answer is somewhere between 5% and 10% of your total actual data. So yep. if you've got about 100 terabytes of actual data, mm -hmm. um, which usually means you've got about 500 terabytes of actual storage with the way that people provision stuff for the most part, um, is that that means that you, know, you probably only need like about 10 terabytes of flash, between 5 and 10 terabytes of flash, which as you'll see later on, it's quite possible on even the lowest levels of controllers. Absolutely. Um, another one which we don't talk a lot about is Flash Excel, which is actually a software offering which allows you to use Fusion I.O., uh, I think the QLogic um, flashcards, or even cheap commodity SSDs you can go down from buy from Harvey Norman and use that up inside the, um, up inside the host. We don't charge you for that at all, although you can buy the Fusion I.O. cards from us. And... That allows for those applications which genuinely do have a boatload more flash requirements to be spot added into virtualization environments or to Microsoft environments or to Linux environments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look, it, it, it's quite a compelling option if you want that server side cache. And it, it, and it is a cache consistent mm -hmm. um, server side cache. So, you know, any changes happening in that cache of Flash Excel are absolutely being. You know, checked and 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 managed at the, the at the storage controller level as well. So if you say, for example, do a flash uh, a snap restore at the back end, that's communicated all the way up through the cache layers, even up up to the host. Absolutely. Cool. So again, coming down to how much can we drop onto here? Um, if we take a look, the old thirty two twenty, which is what we have been selling at that that same price point you could put in a maximum of 1.6 terabytes. And that was more than enough for most people, mm -hmm. right? Um, we can now drop in six, right? That's more than three times. It's like, I think it's almost more than four times the amount of flash. And you're actually seeing that you can actually drop in more, um, uh, more flash pool than we can with flash cache, which if anybody's interested, has to do with things like tag stores and some other interesting RAM, RAM occupying stuff. But we're really beginning to see flash pool come of age, and I think that you're going to see people using flash pool a lot more than flash cache going into the into the future. Yep, I, um, I, I totally agree with that. Yeah, um, and look, if you really want more than that, 18 terabytes, which using my rule of thumb would be enough to accelerate 180 terabytes of actual data, and that's just with one dual controller. Right, we don't have to go scale out for that. If we start scaling this out. We then start multiplying this over and over and over again, which is actually kind of exciting. Absolutely, and if, you, if, you, and if you're building that in with SSDs and a hybrid shelf, right, you're adding that capability as you go, rather than investing once again that flash in the, that flash in the controller up front, yep. and then using it over the time. Um, you are really, you know, as you're adding storage, you're adding you're adding speed. Yep, um, and again, you're seeing a boatload more just DRAM inside these systems, which has traditionally been one of the easiest ways of making these things perform brilliantly. I mean, if you take a look. Um, 48, well, 64 megs, uh, gigs of RAM inside the 8040 is—it's more than we used to have in the old 6000, 6010 series. So exactly right, and you know, and that, and that in itself is 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 one way that we're really um, enabling us to add more of these nodes in a cluster, and remove those caveats, right? Yeah. Because you know, we we need some memory to to add a control to a cluster to to let it manage itself as part of the cluster. Yeah. And um, a lot more onboard Ethernet, which again I'll talk about a little further on. Um, Did we ask that question around the ports and stuff? I think the information was there for that. 
Um, yep. Okay. So one of the questions was, can you pl please clarify the statement, requires software installed on server for Flash Excel? Um, we're talking about installing that into the guest OS, yep. um, is the answer to that question. Um, so the question was, um, are they talking about installing the component to ESXi or the guest OS? Um, as much as I would love to be installing software into ESXi, VMware, and as much as they love us, um, I don't think they're loving us quite that much at this point in time. No. Um, but we can actually do this within the guest OS. We can also do this for bare metal. So again, I'd strongly encourage you to take a look at Flash Excel because it's actually remarkably cool technology. Yep. Um, so a little bit about the hybrid storage performance. We've talked a little bit about Flash. Um, so this is the 8020. Um, I think we've already released these results. If not, I might be in trouble, but either way. Shh, don't um, tell anybody. Two nodes, over 100,000 NFS IOPS um, and over 100,000 SIPS IOPS. These aren't easy ones. These are hard ones. I don't think there's many customers out there outside of our largest ones that are actually doing more than 100,000 NFS or SIFS IOPS inside their file sharing. No, and you know, and when we when we start thinking about that performance is on is on the new entry level mid range box. Yeah. that's pretty impressive, right? Yeah. And do you need it? Probably not. But what it means is you don't need to worry about performance anymore. It's one less thing you need to manage. When all your users log on at eight thirty on a Monday morning, mm -hmm. you're going to be fine. Yep, and um, the SPC one IOPS, which is not the cached random read four K IOPS coming out of you know, coming out of DRAM, these are the hardest kinds of IOPS that you can possibly do. Absolutely. It's kind of like taking something around the Nuremberg, like testing track and going over bumps. Actually, it's probably more like those four-wheel drive testing tracks that they've got <laughs> with the sand traps and stuff. Um, these are hard to do, and these are just the two node results. And in each of these cases, 192 disks plus flash cache, these are, you know, using the flash cache stuff. Um, I'm happy to go into a deep analysis of the performance and stuff like that, but these are very very good results and keep in mind these can be scaled out. Yeah, and I think we've got some, some graphs showing how it actually scales out pretty I well, right? I think I do. I think I included that inside this lot. So again, uh, if we take a look at two node H, HA pairs. Um, so this is a comparison. I don't have numbers on here because some of these numbers um, just, are, are a bit secret and might get slapped. Well, no, it's actually the fact that they're based <laughs> upon the same kinds of benchmarks that we used beforehand, but we can't publish those unless they're fully audited. So it's the same style of benchmark using internal things, but we can't announce the numbers because they're not audited numbers. And I think that's fair. But, okay. but, but the reality is, what, what I'm seeing here is that, you know, an 80-20 is, is, is more than twice the performance of a 32-20. It's more than... It's in, in, almost, in terms of arbitrary yeah, relationship. It's almost more than twice the performance of the 32-50. In fact, it's getting close to the performance of our 6,000. So the entry of our end of our middle little range is now bigger or almost as big as the entry of our top of the range system. So it's a huge bump in each one of these. And platforms. we're back to that enormous return investment that if a customer needs that kind of performance for yep. their workloads, you know, then they're not paying an enormous amount of money to get it. Yeah. Um, again, if we take a look at the scale out limits, the big differences between the thirty two twenty and the eighty twenty. Um, the reason why it's so much bigger is that in the 30, 3220, we were limited to only having eight nodes in a cluster, yep. right? That's no longer the case. This is a part of the whole thing about the fact that these things are built for cluster mode. So it's 24 nodes straight out the gate. Less of a bump for the 62s because, again, that's 24 nodes versus 24 nodes. But still really, really big numbers. Yeah, impressive. Yeah, six times higher throughputs in, in cluster modes. Um Online transaction processing, again, I'm happy to go through and give people some more of the, the, the nitty gritty, but much, not just a little bit faster, but significantly faster in each of these cases. 60%, two times higher, three times higher, right? Yeah, we're just leveraging that hardware, right? The cores and the, and the, and the extra speed in the memory. Oops, I'm going to flip past that side because I probably shouldn't have the numbers on it. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the... Um, Part of the reason why we're able to get this is the fact that we have spent a lot of time and resources and money making sure that we can actually scale out and use all the cores. So right out the gate, the 68, the 8060 is using all 32 cores in it at launch. Yep. Right. So we're not. There's not a lot more stuff that's going to be pulled out of those CPU cores. Um, although again, I understand that there's there is still performance improvements which will be coming in future releases of ONTAP with that same hardware. Yeah, and as a software company pretending to be a hardware company, pretending to be a software company, this is really exciting, right? It means that the guys that are actually writing the code 
and the guys that are sourcing the hardware and building the platforms have got it absolutely right. Yeah, we're actually in lockstep together. We are in sync. Yeah, and that's that's really nice. So yeah, again, multi-core isn't new for NetApp. No, right? it's not. It's something we've been working on <laughs> for quite years some and time, years and years. And there's more improvements in the roadmap as we go through. So right. you know, this this is you know millions of dollars of R and D gone into this to make sure this stuff will work really effectively. So for those of you, I'll just double check to see whether we've got any more questions on the chat. Um, I'm new to NetApp. Do they still have the V-Series in the 8000 range or just the FAS? So there is no V-Series. It is now just a software license. That's yep. the Flex Array software. So, so when, you're, when you're quoting any 8000 platform, you just option on Flex Array as the software so, item, and that provides, provides you with... with you know the same the same kind of v-series functionality and you know you could do that at the point of sale as we said or you could do that afterwards okay so i'm going to try using the pen feature here i don't know if this will actually pop up but um this is the 2020 8020 i should say um two sas ports which are sitting over here okay and that allows you to connect a stack of shelves now for most cases you're only really going to be needing to have one stack of shelves per controller and if you want to have another stack, you're probably better off adding that stack. And a stack is six shelves, okay? Mm -hmm. From a performance, matching the performance perspective, especially when we throw in the SSD drives, it's probably better to buy another controller and match that to the stack of shelves. This is part of the reason why in the past we designed these systems so that you said, I'm going to buy a controller which will give me this much performance, Yep. and then I'll add the shelves on underneath. Now I think we're changing the thing about, well, let's talk about how much disk and... Um, uh, yeah, you know, SSD do you need? And then we throw the appropriate controller sitting on top of that. Um, so if you need to, there are two additional PCI slots that we can drop anything into. And in most likelihood, people will probably add in an extra like four port um, uh, SAS connector onto that is what I think most yeah, people Yeah, and use some more for. gig or another CNA, UTA, yeah. yeah, all kinds of options there. Gigabit Ethernet, that's useful for doing things like Snap Mirror if you want to isolate out your mirroring traffic or you just got some people who just need to connect up a NAS share by Gigabit Ethernet. There's still an awful lot of Gigabit out there. It's surprisingly still very, very good even for most people's like large NAS environments. So that's sitting there quite happily. Um, these two 10 Gigabit ports here, while you can use them to connect up to um, a 10 Gigabit uplink and probably people running in 7 mode will use them for that, I really think that you need to think of these 10 gig ports as being there to be used as the cluster interconnects. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the UTA twos or the UAT twos, no UTA, Unified Target Adapter twos. These are either fiber channel or 10 gigabit Ethernet, and you just change that with a software setting. Um, bunch of management ports and USB console ports, which are interesting, but unless you're setting the systems up, probably not so. But it does actually provide you with a complete out of band management. So this is where our remote lights management out capability sits in and stuff like that. So even if the main controllers have died, um, which doesn't happen, but even if you need, you know, even if those things aren't working the way, you know, you can't contact them, you can get to these through the out of band management through the RLM card, which runs its own operating system and, you know, gives you yeah. all those really high end RAS features that people, have, you know, have learned to expect. Absolutely. Um, the 8040 and 8060. Um, again, a boatload of 10 gig ports, which again, now you notice there's four lots of these. The reason why we need that many 10 gig ports is because these things have such good sequential throughput, especially on remote. Yeah, we've tuned a lot of stuff for the remote stuff, a lot of things happening over RDMA, some really cool things, is that yes, we will actually saturate 20 gigabytes, 20 gigabits of performance fairly easily on this. Within the cluster? Within the cluster. Gotcha, right. so we're asking them to connect up 40 gigabits between, to, to enable that cluster interconnect. Correct, Perfect. and we have a lot more of these UTA2s, which again means more host connectivities, big Q port depths and things like that. A boatload more gigabit ethernet, um, the management and console stays the same, and there's more SAS ports built in. Plus we have a boatload of these other PCI slots. So pretty much, I don't think you're going to need to add the PCI slots in in the first place, and if you do, there's more than enough of them for you to like use in any case. Absolutely. So, um, lots and lots and lots of stuff, and yep. lots of expense, expandability. Um, shelf modules we support is pretty much anything, although you can't connect to the old shelves using the UTA2 port. So if you do, need, do have the old shelves, you're gonna to need to use one of those PCI slots in order to hook, hook a, an old school fiber channel adapter up to that. Yep. Similarly, if you want to hook directly up to tape 
you're going to need a fiber channel, old school fiber channel card in that in order to hook directly up to tape. But all fully well. supported, right? All fully supported. Yep. And we're you know even going down to seventy two. Oh, no, no. So we won't go down to the old seventy two gigabyte um, uh, fiber channel drives. Yeah. Who cares? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you do, please come and talk to us. We have better solutions for you. Um, it still has leading integration, um, the FAS hardware, and this is not because the 8000 has done specific things for this, but because this is data on tap, which means that things like uh, hooking into things like the VMware HCL and the Cisco HCL and everybody else's stuff will happen really, really quickly. Um, that the only real difference is here is getting people to test those new unified target adapters. Um, so that will happen really nicely and quickly. And you'll be able to use this with FlexPod very, very soon as well. So yeah, the those... differences are being done right now, and they're due out in the very, very near future. Yes. So um, I was kind of hoping that I'd say right yes. now, but it's real soon now. Mm. Um, so again, these things are built to be running within FlexPod, within the conversion infrastructure stacks, which is the way that people are using this stuff. Absolutely. So um, lovely animated slide. Um, I'm just going through, seeing if there's any more questions. Um, so one of the questions is, is that the image for the complete chassis or per file ahead? That is per head, okay? So there's two of those in each chassis, okay? Um, the OS entitlement and how that's supported, I will do that in a minute if I can. Uh, proven efficiency and a bunch of other stuff. Um, on command, so we still have the full storage stuff, the full software suite. Um, now, one of the questions about the OS pricing, what we've done is we've separated out the operating system pricing from the um, disk pricing, right? So now what happens is that the net cost is the same, okay? You're still paying the same amount for the capacity inside those systems. But what happens is by doing this, we actually show the value of cluster data on tap versus the hardware. And I think that this is becoming we, important because people are going, how can you be charging that much for a disk? We've been penalised in the past, right, and criticised the price of our storage compared to somebody else's storage. You yeah. know, if I have to go and buy a, a disk from, from, you know, Dick Smith's, it doesn't cost that much. Well, the reality is there's a value associated with, it, with the, the OS. So we've the net price is the same to the end customer. Absolutely. Yep. We've separated that out. What it gives us is the flexibility, right? So if, if we're selling clustered on tap, there's a value associated with that operating system. Yep. The disk is the same. Yep. If, if we sell um, an Easter eggs array, Centricity has a value. It may be less in value yep. than, than clustered data on tap, but the disk prices might be the same. And with the Mars OS coming out with our new all flash array later this year, you know that may have a different value associated with it as well. Yep. So um, again, that should reflect, and the, the pricing practices and things like that that will go with that going forward, for things like years four and five, will be very similar to the way that we handle disks now. Although, again, I'll double check that if anybody needs that. Yeah. Um, the flex array software, we've touched, we talked, on, that, we've touched on that. We talked about those. Uh, so I'll rip that with, past that relatively quickly. The setup and management I talked about we've again. simplified that. Simplified that. Interesting videos internal for those of you who are... Interesting watching Beefy set up an old school cluster. Um, <laughs> and if you get a chance to take a look at this software, it's actually really slick. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, we've kind of used most of our time. Um, so uh, we would ask you to um, uh, ask any questions. I'll be opening up the lines now. Um, the conference is now in talk mode. So, yes, Matt, you wanted to... Ask uh, something. No. Oh, well, can you add more expansion slots just than just two in the 8020? The short answer is no, you can't. Okay? And again, this comes back to, and I'm more than happy to go through and talk to you about this, but keep in mind that with the 8020, if you need things which are more slots, you're probably better off actually going out and buying another one. Because here's an interesting thing when you take a look at the pricing exercises, the cost of two 8020s is quite similar to the cost of a single 8040. So by buying that next 8020, you've suddenly got you know, more SAS ports, you've got more CPU, you've got more PCI slots. So again, start thinking scale out rather than scale up. But if you really need it, the 8040 is there for you. Okay, um, any other questions? So please, um, Uh, I mentioned that stack is six shells. Uh, when did it change from ten? If it is ten, then I'm wrong. I just remember it being six. Um, maybe I'm going back to old school five channel. I've been here for too long. I don't think there's any, any change. If somebody is is slightly more geeky than we are, then then we will accept that we're wrong. <laughs> okay. 
Um, again, uh, one of the things is don't forget to come, to, if you come to Cisco Live, come and see us at the booth. Um, stay connected to us. There is a NetApp ANZ um, Twitter handle and the hashtag is FazOut1000, so we will be going through um, tweeting some stuff about that. Um, there is an ANZ info at netapp.com if you have any specific questions. Um, I'll come back because apparently people missed some of the stuff. Um, so the do we is now in silent mode. Do we have um, a... Uh, can you add more than two stacks to the 8020? No, you can't. That's why we have scale out to a certain extent, or you can buy the 8040. That's right. Um, you know, the 8020 is roughly speaking half the price of an 8040, right? As far in as terms the, of the controller, In yes. terms of the controller and stuff like that, and the software that goes with it, even when you add in things like the, the cluster, cluster node, for me, if I was buying an 8040, I would be very, I, in fact, I would probably look at buying a four node 8020 cluster rather than a two node 8040. Absolutely. That's the way that I would probably look at that. But it really depends upon things like how you want to lay out your aggregates, which is the reason why I say start with your disks and your disk requirements first, then figure out the controllers you need on top of that. Um, so when did it move from six to 10, uh, from 10 to six, it never did. I was probably just wrong. No, I think the same limitation applies that you can you can you can flick from one disk shelf type to a, to to only one one change, right? Yeah, that's so right. So SAS you can to SATA, but you can't go back to SAS. On yeah, one. absolutely. So you know, the, in the old days, you used to have to have your SAS on one and your SATA on the other, and that was a, a throwback back to the old days. We're, we're quite conservative about our making changes to best practice recommendations because we want to make sure that people are hundred percent safe. So when we recommend something or we make it a poss possibility within the infrastructure, we need to make sure that's been really, really, really well tested. Yes. Um, and so there's stuff which you can do on these systems which we're not talking about just yet because we want to make sure that you're 100% safe. So there's a lot of headroom in these systems, a lot of stuff coming up, um, and stay tuned for the, for the next range of statements because it's going to be an exciting year. It is. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any last questions before okay. we close the call? Uh, one last question was, so if I want to buy a V-Series, what do I ask for? You either ask for the Flex Array license or you can still purchase V-Series in the old 32 and 6200 range. Exactly right. Thanks very much, and it's been real. Cheers.